So we've been talking about the argument from ignorance, um, and this is a very simple argument, as we saw, that you don't know these things we've called ordinary propositions. So it's an argument that tries to establish we don't know things like the proposition that we have hands, or that you're watching this video right now. And the argument has two very simple premises. One is the premise that you don't know that you're not a brain in a bat, or you, in more generally, you don't know um, heavyweight propositions. And the second pre premise is that, well, if you don't know that you're not a brain in a bat, then you also can't know that you don't that you have hands. So if you are ignorant of the heavyweight proposition, then you also must be ignorant of the ordinary proposition. As we saw, the first premise comes from this dreaming argument. The idea being that, well, if you were a brain in a bat, or if you were dreaming, or you were being deceived by an evil demon, you would have exactly the same evidence as you seem to have right now. Things would seem exactly the same. Um, but if things would seem exactly the same, then it looks like you can't rule out that possibility, because your evidence is just compatible with that possibility. So, we're supposed to be led to believe, you cannot therefore know that you're not a brain in a bat. The second premise, um, that if you don't know that you're not a brain in a bat, you also don't know that you have hands, comes from this principle that knowledge is closed under known entailment. So what that says is that if you know something, if some proposition P, and you know that P entails some other proposition Q, um, then you must also thereby know Q. And the reason for thinking this is a nice principle just comes from observing that we seem to extend our knowledge all the time through deduction, and closure explains how this would be possible. Last week when we talked about Nozick, we saw that his tracking theory rejects the second premise of the argument. He rejects the closure principle. He says there are situations where you do know you have hands, um, but you also don't know that you're not a brain to that. In fact, we're, this is our situation almost all the time. So he rejects the closure principle. But we saw that that is a, a response to the argument that comes with a number of costs. Closure is this very plausible idea about how knowledge works and how we're able to extend our knowledge with deduction. And it's not enough to just deny closure. You've got to come up with some alternative. You've got to tell us how do we actually use uh, deduction to extend our knowledge, if not with closure. And coming up with an alternative is no small task, as we saw. The other thing we observed was that even though Nozick's theory is a kind of relevant alternatives theory of knowledge, it doesn't look like relevant alternatives theories are required to deny the closure premise. The idea with the relevant alternatives theory was that to know something, you only have to rule out or be in a position to rule out some of the possibilities where the relevant proposition is false. And when you think about it like that, and when you observe that the dreaming argument seems to involve this very strong theory of knowledge, it's natural to wonder, well, why can't we just instead deny the first premise of the argument? Why can we not instead deny um, that we don't know that we're not brains and bats? Why not say we do know? We do know that. Uh, we do know that we're not brains and bats. This is the kind of approach that we're going to look at today. Um, and the way that it's going to work is it's going to try to explain away two problems um, that face us when we try to reject the first premise. Because one thing we have to do, even if we reject the first premise, is explain why does the dreaming argument seem like such a good argument? Because it really does seem like quite a good argument. When you put this to, to be ordinary people, they're very quick to become skeptics. They're very quick to accept the conclusion um, that you don't know that you're not a brain in a bat. So any argument that, that rejects this premise has to explain to us why does the argument feel so compelling, even if the relevant alternatives theory is true. The second thing it has to do is sort of make sense of the idea that we would not be considering um, the possibilities where we're, where we're brains and bats, even when we're considering the knowledge of the proposition that we're not brains and bats. Because remember, as we said in our discussion on Wednesday, this seems like structurally an odd thing for the relevant alternatives theory to say. The idea is that when we're trying to assess whether somebody knows something or not, we're looking at the possibilities that are relevant. But you might have thought, well, surely, when you're thinking about the proposition that you're not a brain of that, possibilities where you are a brain of that must be relevant. So any kind of relevant alternatives theorist that tries to deny this first premise has to give us some sort of explanation of 
how could this be? How could it be that we're not considering um, possibilities where you're not a brain in a vat? Because they look like a very natural candidate for the things to be relevant. So in David Lewis's elusive knowledge, we're going to see a theory which tries to deny the first premise of the argument, but in a way that answers both of the kinds of questions that we just saw. So on the one hand, it's going to try to explain why do we find the argument from dreaming so convincing? Why, why are we so ready to become skeptics once we hear the argument? But it's also going to try to give an answer to this problem about what possibilities are relevant. It's going to give us, in fact, a set of rules which tell us exactly in a given context which possibilities are relevant. So the theory is going to embrace closure. It's not going to deny the closure premise. Um, it's instead going to try to say, well, in some sense, in some contexts, uh, we do know that we're not brains and bats. The theory is going to be a relevant alternative theory in the sense we've been talking about. It's going to say that for somebody to know something, for, something, for somebody to know some proposition P, they have to rule out all the relevant possibilities where P is false, or have to rule out all the relevant possible worlds where P is false. But the big idea is going to be that what possibilities are relevant can change from context to context. And slightly more precisely, what the word knows means can change from context to context because the kinds of possibilities that are relevant um, is determined by the linguistic context that we're in. What this means is that in ordinary contexts where we're not worrying about uh, skeptical scenarios, we're going to count as knowing both ordinary propositions and skeptical propositions. On the other hand, in contexts like in the philosophy room or the epistemology room, where we're worrying about brains and bats and whether we are them, we're going to not count as knowing either of those things. We're not going to count as knowing that we have hands, we're not going to count as knowing that we're brains and bats. So there's going to be no violations of closure. Knowledge of the two things are going to go together in the way that closure says they should. But the further important thing that's going to be really important for explaining away uh, the problems for denying the first premise is that when we start considering brain and bat scenarios, that will tend to push us into skeptical contexts. It will tend to push us into contexts where skeptical possibilities become relevant. Um, and this is going to help explain basically the pull of skeptical arguments, because once we start thinking about skeptical possibilities, that pushes us into contexts where those possibilities become relevant. Um, it pushes us into contexts um, where we no longer count as knowing things like we have hands.